The impacts of fossil fuel driven climate change in the Arctic are starkly apparent. On average, it is warming nearly four times faster than the global mean. This phenomenon is known as Arctic amplification and is caused by feedback processes that have knock-on effects to the world's environment and population. Interact research stations are monitoring changes to the environment over the whole of the Arctic. And scientists are working to understand the importance of these changes for local people and the global community. Carbon dioxide is important in our atmosphere as it absorbs and radiates heat. Without it, our Earth would freeze. But by adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, humans are supercharging the natural greenhouse effect, causing global temperatures to rise. Since the Industrial Revolution, uh, our emissions has been like unprecedented uh, over time. We have reached record high emissions uh, to the atmosphere from our global society. The effects from this are particularly apparent in the Arctic. The last seven years has been some of the warmest years ever recorded and calculated for the Arctic area. To understand why accelerated warming is occurring in the Arctic, we must first look at the albedo effect. Historically, the shiny white ice and snow-covered Arctic has reflected solar radiation. But warming of the Arctic is causing a reduction in both the area and duration of ice and snow cover. The albedo effect is losing power, and more energy is being absorbed by the dark oceans and land causing the Earth's surface to heat up, further reducing this cover. Compared to, to present day, we have seen like end of summer sea ice content being, roughly speaking, 40% lower in area compared to 1979. This creates a feedback loop to even further warming, melting and evaporation. Reduced snow cover on land can affect the boreal forests, making them more susceptible to drought. Coupled with record high temperatures and increased lightning strikes, this creates the perfect conditions for fires. Fires are becoming more frequent and more intense across the Arctic, adding carbon dioxide further to our anthropogenic emissions. Arctic fires in the summer of 2020 were unprecedented, releasing almost 250 megatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere the highest since satellite records began in the mid-1990s. Although fire is a natural process, there is concern that with a changing regime, the ecosystem may struggle to recover to its former state before being engulfed once again. If you're talking about a forested system, it could be up more than 100 years before you get back to kind of where you were before. With a rapidly changing climate, the forest may shift to different species, impacting biodiversity and productivity, which could reduce its ability to store carbon. It, it's like you're drawing your bank account down as opposed to having your finances be in a closer to a steady state situation. Not only does warming affect vegetation above ground, it has the potential to affect permafrost below ground. Permafrost is any material that is perennially frozen for two years or more. It covers about 17 million square kilometers in the circumpolar north and is a feature of the tundra but also interlaced parts of the boreal forest. These ecosystems have been capturing carbon in the form of dead plants and animals and storing it in soils for thousands of years. In a frozen state, it has been unavailable to microbes to decompose. However, due to warming, the permafrost is thawing. This carbon store is now becoming available for microbial decomposition, liberating the greenhouse gases carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. We are reaching situations where areas with permafrost are getting out of equilibrium with the present day climate. And with more of these gases coming from the thawing permafrost, that it will be increasing the warming and that in turn will of course lead to accelerated uh, thawing and thereby you have a feedback loop that can be uh, quite a significant factor in the climate system. We have documentation and uh, very dramatic consequences of the permafrost thawing uh, very close to our, uh, our home, if you like, the research station up at, in the Sackenberg Valley. Sackenberg Research Station, an Intrap member, is located in the high Arctic of northeast Greenland and was established to monitor the climate change effects predicted by the first IPCC report in 1990. 
Sagenberg is positioned in one of the most remote places in the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. So when we see changes up there, we can ascribe them to human actions. Then it is only through the climate and not through direct disturbance that we are seeing impacts on these ecosystems. And uh, we have been observing a lot of the things that was already predicted back in 1990. We have seen the active layer depth increase year by year. We have also in recent years seen erosional events and they actually in some cases collapsed rapidly over a few days. So climate change is happening and it's acting as we speak. It is not as if we didn't know it would happen. We knew that many decades ago. But just how much carbon might be liberated remains a major question facing many scientists. If we look at high northern latitudes, then we have an estimated uh, 1,300 gigaton of carbon stored. That's uh, significantly more than what we currently have in the atmosphere as uh, the total amount of CO2. So if we were to release all this in one go, we would more than double the atmospheric concentration of CO2. The, the general sort of overall pattern of how if the ecosystems are going to respond is probably one of the key questions that we cannot really answer at the moment. With warming comes thawing, but also an increase in plant productivity or the greening of the Arctic, such as tundra shrubification and the tree line moving north. This may help to counterbalance some of the carbon release from decomposition. On the other hand, extreme climate events are damaging vegetation, known as browning. The jury is very much out, uh, and uh, that's also, of course, where we need data, we need observations, we need long-term monitoring of these processes to see if we can detect any, any trends. Interact research stations working together across the Arctic are therefore vital facilities to help estimate our global carbon budget. To understand Arctic amplification impacts outside the Arctic, we should consider the potential effects of the polar jet stream. So the jet stream is a, a giant um, current of air in, in the atmosphere that um, circulates around from west to east. It has some waves in it, but essentially it's transporting weather systems around the um, middle latitudes. The polar jet stream is partly driven by the temperature difference between the Arctic and lower latitudes. But Arctic amplification is reducing this gradient and one theory suggests this may in turn slow and destabilise it. As the jet stream weakens, a bit like a river meandering across a floodplain, um, it becomes wavier and slower moving, and so you can get more stuck or persistent extreme weather patterns, typically in middle latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. So there have been many examples of extreme events in the last um, 10 or 15 years um, that have directly resulted from jet stream changes, droughts, floods, record cold snaps, record heat waves. Extreme events have even affected Greenland with a vast increase in the last decade. In September 2022, an unprecedented late season warming event caused temperatures to reach zero degrees Celsius, 3,000 meters above sea level. But that's very unusual for, for as late as September because that's well into the time of the year when, when the ice sheet's normally cooling in, in the autumn. These um, statistics have never been seen before for the month of September in, in Greenland in modern records. The Greenland ice sheet has lost around 4.7 trillion tonnes of ice between 2000 and 2022. Melting of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, as well as ocean terminating glaciers, have further implications for much of the world's population living near coastlines. At present, flooding from sea level rise affects over 200 million people around the world. We expect that uh, the global mean sea level will rise up to a metre in 2100, but we will also see like a higher frequency of, of, of floodings when it comes to, to low layering areas. What we today see as an event every 100 years, uh, will likely be an event we will see every, every single year when we move uh, towards 2100. By 2100, a one metre rise in sea level could affect over 400 million worldwide. But sea level rise is just one of the many symptoms of Arctic amplification. The 2022 IPCC report suggests that even now, there are over 3 billion highly vulnerable to climate change.
in every single region on, on the planet, uh, people will uh, feel consequences uh, due to a changing climate system. And there is no doubt that regardless what we talk about in terms of feedback mechanisms from uh, these natural ecosystems, the absolute strongest impact on climate is still going to be the man-made emissions. We do have this unique opportunity um, in a way that we're very powerful to control the environment in a way that um, most of our ancestors weren't even a generation or two ago. So I think energy is quite important here because we need to figure out how we can produce energy even more efficient and even more renewable compared to what we have done uh, earlier in history. An explorer once said, there's no such thing as bad weather, only unsuitable clothing. Although we can and must slow down climate change, future generations will live in a different world than ours. Interact research stations and researchers working with local and indigenous people are totally dedicated to understand the changes in the Arctic and what this means to the rest of planet Earth so we can adapt to a new world that future generations can enjoy.